Hello, I'd like to thank you once again for tuning in to this week's message. If you'd like more information about Journey Church, its various ministries, be sure to check us out at journeychurch.org or find us on Facebook where you can get additional resources to help you just grow in your walk of faith. We hope to see you sometime. If you're ever in the Jacksonville area, come on in and say hello. God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. In this message today, we're going to be going deep. We're going to be talking about the rescue. And Lord, I pray that you give us eyes to see. I pray that you confound the enemy and any attempts that he might have to distract us, to keep us from what you want to speak to each of our hearts and minds today. Would you give us the power to put your word and what we hear and what we learn into practice in our lives today? Lord, let the magnitude of today's topic grip us, Lord God. Let its truth rock us to the core. Let your love change us, O oh God. Lord, would you move amongst the people who are here and those who are online today, inspiring us who have already been rescued to leave from this place and go out and tell the world about your goodness. How could we not tell them about how much you saved us from and what you've saved us for? Lord, would you move in our hearts? Would you move in our minds today? Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today we're going to be talking about Jesus, the rescuer, as part of the overarching story of God and our Foundations of the Faith series that we find ourselves in right now. And, you know, I was looking for something to like Netflix binge on, so to speak. Uh, Mary Jo and I were trying to find a new show to watch, and a lot of people had talked about this show, Game of Thrones. So we said, let's watch a couple of the episodes. So first and foremost, be careful. You better have fast forward ready. There was some bad stuff. So we watched like two episodes. I was like, oh my goodness. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, Lord. Help me out here. So disclaimer up front. If you're going to go watch that, be ready to fast forward some bad junk. Maybe we shouldn't even be watching that as believers. But there was a scene in there that really captivated me in light of what was um, in today's message. There was a scene where this guy was thrown in jail. And they got really cool with the way that they had created this jail. Um, if you can envision a cliff, like just a massive, massive cliff, and then um, maybe the best analogy would be a cave carved out of a cliff. So in this case, it was a castle, and behind the castle was the back portions of the jail, but the cells were actually just way up on this cliff. So it's a big open expanse, so you could kind of get out. There's no bars there, but if you get out, you're, you're falling down into the abyss. But the prisoner could see the beauty and glory and majesty of the kingdom that surrounded them, but they in no way could touch it, right? So they had this window out there into the beauty and the splendor that was surrounding them, but they were held captive in that particular cell. So as we often do, even in our own lives, one of the things that we do is we want to buy our way out of that jail cell. So this guy calls and he's knocking on the door and he's trying to get the jailer to come. And then he starts to tell the jailer, I've got gold. Do you know my name? Do you know who I am? Do you know who my family is? I will compensate you if you help get me out of this mess. Maybe we don't do so in our own lives with uh, money, uh, you know, but we do it with other things as well. We try to bargain with God. Lord, I won't do this again if you'll help me out. Will you get me out of here? And we look oftentimes to worldly things for our rescue. And even as believers, we're often trapped. We could see the beauty of the Lord all around us, but we're caught up in our own sin and we don't know how to get out. We're caught up in our own anger. We're caught up in our own faithlessness. We're caught up with fear. We're caught up with relational problems. And we find ourselves in bondage. And the Lord shows us His glory and His majesty. But sadly, even in our sinfulness as believers, sometimes we choose to stay in the cell. You see, in God's economy, the cell actually works opposite. The Bible says that He comes to the door and knocks. And if we'll open our hearts, he will come in. If we'll only say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, would you forgive me? Jesus, would you help me? He will come in and change your circumstances and change your situation. Most importantly, he will change you from the inside out. He will rescue you from darkness. In fact, when you look at the stories that are written and the stories that we watch on TV, be it Game of Thrones, be it, uh, uh, how many of y'all saw Wonder Woman recently? Did anybody go and see that new movie? Pretty cool movie. I mean, think of all the movies with heroes in them, right? 
You know, every good story that you see out there in the movie theater actually has its origins in this epic story of God. All of them uh, are looking for a rescue, are they not? Almost every good story, there's some maiden in distress. There's someone that needs a rescue. And the story kind of reaches this uh, pinnacle, the peak of where it's at when the rescue actually occurs, right? It's the making of a good story. And they're always good in that way because their roots are actually generally very biblical, right? But guess what, people? Your rescuer is not Keanu Reeves. Your rescuer is not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Your rescuer is not Wonder Woman. Your rescuer is not Captain America. Your rescuer is none other than the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, right? So keep that in mind as we dive into today's topic. And we're in a series that is foundational in nature. We've got a lot of scripture. Do not get distracted. But the topic that we're studying is of vital importance. The Apostle Paul describes the foundations of the faith and particularly the gospel in this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1. It says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So this topic, the gospel, the foundations of the faith, the Bible says we need to know this stuff intimately. We have to have it deeply rooted within us so that we understand who we are and where our identity can be found in. So it's something that God wants us to study. It's something that God wants us to dive into. In this world of distraction that we live in, he wants us to focus on this because it really matters. So in this series, we've already talked about our loving creator. Don did such a great job in kicking off this series talking about God, the creator of the universe. Last week, one of our elders, Jim, talked about our utter depravity and the sinful nature that we have that's apart from God and the fact that all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. And we live in cosmic rebellion against the creator of the universe, but he still loves us enough to come to save us. We can't make our own rules. We can't call our own shots. We have a creator who loves us and ultimately Um, In light of last week a little bit, we need to really understand the importance of the rescue. And I think, and how desperate we are apart from God. The longer we've been saved, sometimes we forget about how destitute we were apart from God. But to really understand and fathom and respect and honor and love the rescue, you need to understand how jacked up we really are, right? And I think that's a little bit about what last week was all about. You see, sometimes I think we suffer from, I think, what the world calls Stockholm Syndrome. You know what that is? Where you get so close to your captor that you start to think that that's the right way to live, so to speak. So we get so close to our sin, we kind of ultimately, even though it wants to destroy us, even though it wants to keep us captive, even though it wants to keep us in bondage, even though it wants to keep us from the truth and keep us from freedom, we like hanging out there for some reason. Anybody ever experienced that with some of the sin in your life? Willing to be honest? The rest of you, yes, you have issues too. We'll be praying for you, right? There's truth in that, right? I think we can all understand that to a degree. There's things in our life that we don't really like that we know need to go, but somehow we allow them to stay and then we think we'll miss them if they're gone. But God shows us his beauty and majesty even while we're in that jail cell and he wants you to be able to get out of there. And I think he's going to do that for some people today. But we need to understand the magnitude of just how sinful we are, how appalling it is to God, how horrendous it is. And we can't continue to make life of it for the Bible takes it very seriously. And it says the penalty for sin is none other than death, right? So we need a rescue. We need a savior. We need someone apart from ourselves to come and rescue us from our own sinfulness. So today... As we look back from where we've been, maybe in the creation we started in the tree of life. It's where God originally intended us to be and to live in the garden with him, to walk in peace and harmony with the kingdom. And then we talked about the knowledge of good and evil, so to speak, as we found another tree where Adam and Eve took of the fruit 
and ended up falling in their own sinful behavior, which leads us to yet another tree that was on Golgotha, a tree where Jesus hung in front of heaven and earth and died a sinner's death in our place that we might have life. And he continues to work in us and through us to continue his story in our own generation. So let's take a look at God's rescue plan for humanity. You know what the most powerful set of words a human can speak are? Lord, save me. Lord, rescue me. It acknowledges humility. It acknowledges his lordship. Lord, deliver me. Lord, I love you. Lord, I praise you. Lord, I give you glory for I'm not what I once was. I'm becoming who you want me to be. All old things are passed away. May I die to myself. May I die to the things of this world. May I rise as in baptism and newness of life and tell the world of your glory to make this profession public because you came and rescued me. Who in the natural that has been rescued would not go and tell the world about the rescuer that came to save him? We who are believers, may we continue to spread the good news of the gospel to those who find themselves in bondage that they can get the hope that we have in our own hearts and minds. Mark 1.1 tells us about this story from a New Testament perspective. It says, In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, who we'll read later, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming the baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. And all around the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So Mark opens up in this story-like fashion and tells us that God was there in the beginning and Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit spoke the world into existence and man fell and was in need of a rescue, was in need of a Savior and that Savior would come in the form of Jesus Christ, the Word of God becoming flesh to dwell among us and give us hope to die in our place for our sins. So John comes heralding this good news. I often say that we who are Journey Church, we who are the people of God in our generation, we need to be John the Baptists. All too often I feel that we get tunnel vision. Oftentimes that comes in the form of our phones and I'm as guilty as anybody else. We tunnel vision ourselves into this world, right? And we look at this little screen And the world's going on around us and God's putting divine appointments alongside of us. There's people that he wants us to meet. There's people he wants us to share the good news with. He wants us to have this 360 degree vision or 365 degree vision where we see the world around us for who he created it to be with all its beauty and splendor and fallenness in the midst of it. And he wants us as believers to live these lives as ones who have been rescued to see those around us who need to know him and share the good news. We need to see the people around us as captives who need to be set free. How would our perspectives change if we would look at our friends and our loved ones in that way? Those who have been rescued, may we go out and be God's hands and feet to tell others about this rescue. See, Mark opens up the gospel with an account of Jesus' life and gives us words of great hope. You can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.15, right after the fall, God begins to do this setup in this grand story. He says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He gives us this hope of a savior that is yet to come. One author writes it this way. The Bible tells the story of how this tiny seed of good news has germinated, sprouted and grew. For thousands of years, God prepared the world through the law and prophecy for his stunning coup de grace against the serpent and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When it was all over, the guilt Adam had inflicted on his entire race would be defeated. The death God pronounced over his own creation would die and hell would be brought to its knees. 
The Bible is the story of God's counteroffensive against sin. It is the grand narrative of how God made it right, how he is making it right, and how he will one day make it right finally and forever. And we as believers get to be a part of that great story. The gospel writers Mark and Luke tell the story of an angel coming to a young virgin named Mary and telling her she would give birth to the Son of God. And Luke, it puts it this way in verse 34, chapter 1, And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born to you will be called Holy will be called the Son of God. And John writes and echoes the words of Mark, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14 he says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. These are vitally critical things to understand as believers. As a foundation in the faith, that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless death, that he died in our place for our sins, that he rose again that we might have life, and that, guess what, he's coming again at some point in the future, right? These are part of the narratives we all have to understand as believers. These are the foundations of our faith that starts with the truth of God's word that we see here in Scripture, right? He was born of a virgin. This isn't some fairy tale we're reading about. This is truth that changes everything, does it not? It's changed you. It's changed me. I pray that it'll continue to change those around us as we continue to share it as well. See, we needed this sinless, spotless God-man because no other man can save us. Keanu Reeves is not coming to your rescue, I'm here to tell you, right? No matter how many guns he has in John Wick chapter 2, he is not coming to save you. Hebrews 4.15 also tells us, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and receive the good news. That's what John the Baptist was preaching. The setup for that is so amazing. And what we see in the beginning chapters of John and Mark and all the gospel writers, they tell us about this stuff that we do need to have foundationally the core. That's why we're doing these series. We're teaching ourselves again. If you go back before Easter, what does it mean to evangelize? What does it mean to share our faith? What does it mean to be a part of the family of God, the body of believers? That was the next series we did, right? What does it mean to understand and apply the foundations of the faith? We're doing the basics. We're learning the blocking. We're learning the tackling. We're learning how to put our faith into action with the hope that the kingdom of God would continue to be advanced in our generation. And what we're hearing in that verse in Hebrews is that God was the player coach, was he not? He was in there. He was in the midst of it. He understands all that you're going through. When we mess up, all he asks us to do is fess up. He understands our weaknesses. He understands our pain. And he was able to overcome it. And he wants to give you the strength to overcome and break out of the bondages that continue to ensnare you as well. So in many ways, what we're witnessing is Game of Thrones on a cosmic scale. Are we not? The devil is trying to enslave the kingdoms of this world and God will one day come with a permanent rescue plan. As I was, amen, at least one person's excited about it. I don't know that I'll continue to watch that series, but in trying to grasp those first couple of episodes, there, I guess there were seven kingdoms that were at play and you would get glimpses of each of the kingdoms and some of the kings would be corrupt and others would be people that were you know, good of nature, trying to do the right thing. And we see some of that, when you hear a story like that, it's really like the devil's version of what's going on on a cosmic scale. And that's why those kinds of things intrigue us, because we see it played out even in our modern day, right? Aren't the Republicans and Democrats always doing that kind of junk too? So-and-so's bad. When it was Obama in office, oh, he's this, he's that. Now it's Trump in office, oh, he's this, he's that. I mean, it never ends, right? It's the devil. But one day God will put all this madness to an end. See, throughout the Old Testament, God foretold of a time when his kingdom would rule over all the world. He promised he would establish his kingdom and the person of this messianic king of the royal line of King David. Isaiah tells us this in chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, 
His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forward and forevermore. Isn't that the kind of government that you want to be under? In fact, you're representatives of his kingdom here on earth. We don't have to play the Russia card or now the insanity card or before the Obama wasn't born in America card or you name it, right? We don't have to play any of those cards. God calls us citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We're to be his representatives here on earth, bringing truth and life and hope and showing people another way in the midst of the madness that we see around us. Luke 1.32 He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So the Jewish people continue to wait for their earthly Messiah who will overthrow and supplant the Roman Empire. He will one day come again and bring all these things to pass. John 18, 36 came. When Jesus came, he came declaring a different world than they were, ta- they were thinking of. They were thinking of these natural implications of it but jesus tells them my kingdom is not of this world so jesus the king of the universe the creator of all things he was there at the beginning and will be there at the end and one author writes it this way ultimately here is the good news that jesus was heralding but here is where the good news of christianity gets really really good you see king jesus came not only to inaugurate the kingdom of god but also to bring sinners into it by dying in their place for their sins, taking their punishment on himself and securing forgiveness for them, making them righteous in God's sight and qualifying them to share the inheritance of the kingdom. An inheritance in the kingdom. We are citizens of another kingdom is a foundational truth that we need to understand. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This God comes to take away your sins and welcome you into his family, welcome you into his kingdom. He came to rescue us. You see, every Jew knew the story of the Passover. We talked about it around Easter time. The Passover feast and especially the Passover lamb became a powerful symbol of the idea of the penalty of death for one sin could be paid by the death of another. This idea, called technically penal substitution, in fact, grounded the entire system of Old Testament sacrifices. On the annual Day of Atonement, the high priest went into the center of the temple, known as the Most Holy Place, or the Holy of Holies. He killed an unblemished animal as a payment for the people's sins. Year after year, this happened, and year after year, the penalty for the people's sins was deferred yet again by the blood of the Lamb. But Jesus came once and for all time to fulfill that, where he would be the once and for all time sacrifice for your sins and mine, past, present, and future. Thus, they don't need to continue the temple sacrifices anymore because that sacrifice has already been made. God substituted his sinful, spotless life for our destitute lives, right? But then he welcomes us as sons and daughters of the king. Hopefully not many of you have been before a court because you were in trouble. Some of us have experienced that kind of a thing. No amens to that one, right? We know what that's like. You're there at the mercy of the court, so to speak. There's an advocate trying to state your position and get you the least penalty possible if you have a good lawyer, right? Then there's the prosecutor that's standing on the other side, and there's a judge that's there that's going to ultimately um, hopefully have compassion on you or, or dole out the justice that is due. So if you use that analogy in a cosmic scale, you know, you're sitting there and you know you're guilty, You sped, like how many of you sped and then you were like, no, I wasn't speeding. No, that wasn't me, right? It's not that kind of a thing. It's not a cosmic speeding ticket we're talking about here. It's something way deeper. And when we get before the very throne room of God, the reality of that is going to set in very quickly, right? You're going to see God in all his glory and all his majesty. This is called the Bema seat, the judgment seat of God. You know, so to speak, if you can envision or imagine the devil's over here, he's got the list of everything that you've done bad. 
He's a, and you're going to be standing there in the reality of seeing who God is, and immediately all your sins are going to become apparent. And God's really only going to ask us one question, right? He's not going to ask you if you're guilty or not, because he already knows that you're guilty. He knows that you're guilty. The only question that he's going to ask is, who is Jesus to you? It's the only question that really matters, right? Who is Jesus to you? Because Jesus not only is our lawyer and our advocate, he is the one who is willing to stand and die in our place for our sins. He's willing to take the penalty that we should have justly received on him, is what scripture tells us, so that we might be set free and go on to live. You know, there was a lot in that little Game of Thrones. They must have been reading the Bible in that episode that I watched. Because that guy actually gets to go out of that jail. Like the jailer releases him. And then he goes before the king at their judgment seat. And he's like, they're like, you're guilty. You're going to die. We're going to kill you. We're going to throw you down this hole and you're going to go down into the abyss. And he knows he's guilty. But for some reason, he also knows the way that their laws are and that he can call out and their culture an advocate to fight for him. There was a way in their society where they could go and fight somebody else. And if they fought, they could actually win. But in this case, the guy was actually a dwarf in the thing, so he didn't stand much chance against the big guy. So they allowed an advocate to fight on his behalf. And in this case, the advocate goes and he actually beats the other guy. So the little guy gets to go free, right? In this case, I think the little guy is going on to sin by the little bit of an episode that I saw. I don't think he's too grateful for the rescue that occurred. I think he's going to go back out there and live for the world. And sometimes don't we do the same? We're believers and we get saved and we understand for a moment the majesty of what we've been rescued from. Then things seem like they're going pretty good. And then we think that we're the ones who created all those things that are going good. And then we fall back into some of our old patterns and we forget who he is. And then for most of us, if we're just being honest, then something happens bad that shocks the system. And then all of a sudden, oh, Jesus, 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 please. I'll never do it again. Would you forgive me? Would you help me? I won't, I promise. None of y'all do that or is it just me, right? We could be real, right? But what Jesus really calls us to is this constant life of praise. This constant life of remembering the magnitude of what we've been forgiven for, right? When we really get it, like we were going to die. The death penalty was there. It was on us. We deserved it. In that cosmic courtroom, we are absolutely, utterly guilty. And the only hope that we have is to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the foundations of the faith, people. See, it doesn't end at our salvation. It doesn't end at our rescue. As believers, you know, if that were it, we should just die and go be with him instantly, right? Wouldn't that be at times glorious? That's a better alternative. Lord, yes, God. But the reality is he leaves you here for a reason. What is that for? To sing praises of his glory, to sing praises of his rescue. See, this world's going to do everything it can to grab your attention. It's going to do everything it can to distract you from what Paul was talking about in the beginning. This matter of first importance, the gospel, understanding who we are in him and telling the world about him. That's what real life and fulfillment in this life is about. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Thank you, Lord. You are our Messiah. You are our King. You redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. I just want to read from Isaiah. You're welcome to close your eyes and meditate on these words for just a moment. This is your king. Earlier we talked about that Isaiah heralded these things in the Old Testament. He prophetically spoke about them is what, what we're seeing here. In Isaiah 53, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs. Who's he? Jesus. He carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him as stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Think of your sins right now. The ones that are past, present, the ones that you may even have on your mind that God wants to rescue you from and save you from. It says, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. That substitutionary atonement is what we're talking about. And with his stripes... 
we are healed. Those lashes that he took on his very back, they bring healing to us is what scripture says. Yet all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every single one of us to our own way, to our own tunnel vision. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. In the trial, he said not one thing. Like a lamb that was sled to slaughter, and like sheep that before its shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, yet they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in death, they put him in that other tomb. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteousness, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, and yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So what I want you to see there is obviously the prophecy that Jesus would one day come, that he would suffer and die a horrific death, the death that you and I should have received, that God, the Son, is still in heaven right now, it says, interceding for the transgressors. That means for you and for I, he's interceding for us. He wants to see us succeed. He wants us to see us in health. He wants to see us to be a people who have hope, forgiveness, and to be a part of his family. And as he gazes upon you who are his children, he looks on you with great joy in his heart. Your sins are forgiven. They are gone. They are no more because he sees what his son did in your place that you might have hope. This is incredible news that I know that most of you have already received. But there may be some of you here who this is the first time you're hearing this story. God wants to continue to write his story through you. He wants you to be part of his family. He wants you to be there with him in eternity, and so do we. That's why somebody invited you here. That's why they told you to come. They hope that you would surrender your life to this king of the universe. And I pray you would do that right now. I pray you would bow your knee to him and say those words that are some of the most important that we could ever do in humanity and say, Jesus, will you save me? Maybe that's you and you're here today and you need to surrender your life to God. If that's you, I want to pray for you in just a moment. I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you, but I want to pray for you. There's many of you who are believers, but... Maybe you've taken that rescue for granted when you really look at things and today hopefully put some things into perspective for you and you're remembering the goodness of his glory and you want to live for him from this moment forward. You want to live with a fire in your belly. You want to tell the world about him. You want to see some of these bondages and these things that are keeping you captive, gone from your life. This is your moment too. We'd love to pray for you about that as well. We'd love to lay hands on you and say, God, meet them in this place and set them free and set them on fire to live for you. So if that's you, I want to pray for you personally as well. So is today a day where you need to dedicate or maybe rededicate your life to God? If that's you, would you do me a favor right where you're at with all heads bowed and all eyes closed and nobody looking around? If that's you, would you raise your hand up really high so I know who I'm praying for? I see you, young man, and you, sir. Are there others? You better get them up higher. I see your hand, sir, and I see your hand in the back over there, and your hand. Hallelujah. If you raised your hand, I want you to do me a favor, even if you're all the way in the back row and you're one of those people that's up against the wall, come on up here to the front. We will rejoice with you. I promise not to embarrass you, but I'd love to join hands with you and pray for you. If you raise your hand, come on up here to the front. Give God a little bit of glory journey. I see some people here. 
Come on, Jesus. I saw a young man right there. He's welcome to come on up. He can come on up. Come on up, sister. God bless you. Come on up, my brother. God bless you. Journey, rejoice. God still in the rescuing business. Come on right up here. I'll be glad to pray for you. Come on, my brother. God bless you. Glad you're here. Come on. God's not done yet. Look, he's even saving some young people here. Look at these guys. Be fired up for them. We're glad they're here. Journey, you better rejoice. You're getting out of jail today. You can do a little better than that. Yes, yes, yes. God bless you. Congratulations. God bless you. So glad that you're here. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming up. God bless you. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We bow our heads before you, Lord God. You are our God and King. And we say, whether we've said it a hundred times or whether this is the first time, Lord, will you save us? Lord, will you save us? If you're saying that prayer with all your heart, whether you're up here or whether you're sitting in your seats, I'm telling you, he will meet you in this place right now. He hears your prayers and he will set you free. He will save you. Father, I'm so grateful for those who came to the front. That's what this is all about, Lord God, seeing people come to know you. And Lord, we declare publicly together just an affirmation or a reaffirmation of our faith that Jesus, you truly are the son of the living God. You are the one that was spoken of in Mark. You were the one that John spoke about when he said, you are the word made flesh that came to dwell among us. And today, as we're speaking of these foundations of the faith, thank you for giving us the realization that you are who you said you are, that you're the one who created us. Out of dust, you created us. And out of dust, we will return. We have fallen and are desperately in need of a relationship with you. And Father, today we humbly lay ourselves at your feet and we say, God, we need you. God, save us. God, forgive us. God, set us free. God, deliver us. And in turn, Lord, out of the gratefulness for this rescue, may we never forget. May we never be distracted. We, may we never put this on the back burner, that desire to tell people about what you've done for us. Lord, would you set us on fire to serve you and live for you and tell the world about you. Lord, we see others outside of these walls who are in so desperate need of a rescue. They're caught in these jails, some in utter darkness. Others who can see the light of the world outside of them but don't know how to make that move from one place to another, thus they're continuing to be stuck in bondage. Could we, who are residents of your kingdom, be the ones that would go out there and be your hands and feet and tell the world about who you are just as they did in the New Testament early days and watch what you might do to transform our city and its people. Father, I thank you that you're at work today and you proved it by calling some right here up to the front. If you came to the front, I ask you, please do not run immediately back to your seats. Speak to these altar workers who are around you for just a moment. They'd be glad to individually pray for you. They'll give you some information to help you in your next steps of your walk of faith so you could leave here with confidence and with strength, knowing exactly what God wants for you to do in the days ahead. Journey Church, would you put your hands together and clap for them? Give God a little bit of glory today. May we take the blinders off as we leave today. May we go out there and tell the world about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ.